In the last decade of the 18th century England was perhaps the most glorious royal court of the world. Russia was too far away, and was still considered too barbarous for a brilliant court to flourish there. Prussia had the prestige that Frederick the Great won for her, but she was still a comparatively small state. But England was rich and prosperous, and her invincible fleets were extending her empire over the seven seas. The center of fashionable England, however, was not George III, but rather his son, subsequently George IV, who was made Prince of Wales three days after his birth, and who became Prince Regent during the insanity of the King. He was the leader of the social world, the fit companion of Beau Brummel and of a choice circle of rakes and fox hunters. Some called him the first gentleman of Europe. Others, who knew him better, described him as one who never kept his word to man or woman, and who lacked the most elementary virtues. Yet it was his good luck during the first years of his regency to be popular as few English kings have ever been. To his people, he typified old England against revolutionary France, and his youth and gaiety made many like him. He drank and gambled, he kept packs of hounds and strings of horses, he ran deeply into debt that he might patronize the sports of that uproarious day. He was a haunter of dens where there were prize fights and cock fights, and there was hardly a doubtful resort in London where his face was not familiar. Such was George IV in his regency and in his prime. He made that period famous for its car playing, its deep drinking, and for the dissolute conduct of its courtiers and noblemen no less than for the gallantry of its soldiers and its momentous victories on sea and land. It came, however, to be seen that his true achievements were in reality only escapades, that his wit was only folly, and his so-called sensibility was but sham. He invented buckles and flamboyant collars, but he knew nothing of the principles of kingship or the laws by which a state is governed. It is not necessary to number the women whose heads he turned. They are too many for remembrance here, and they have no special significance, save one who, as is generally believed, became his wife so far as the church could make her so. An act of 1772 had made it illegal for any member of the English royal family to marry without the permission of the king. A marriage contracted without the king's consent might be lawful in the eyes of the church, but the children born of it could not inherit any claim to the throne. The one real love story in the life of George IV is that which tells of his marriage with a lady, who might well have been the wife of any king. This was Maria and Smythe, better known as Mrs. Fitzherbert, who was six years older than the young prince when she first met him in company with a body of gentlemen and ladies in 1784. Maria Fitzherbert's face was one which always displayed its best advantages. Her eyes were peculiarly languishing, and, as she had already been twice a widow, and was six years his senior, she had the advantage over a less experienced lover. Likewise, she was a Catholic, and so by another act of Parliament any marriage with her would be illegal. Yet just because of all these different objections the Prince was doubly drawn to her, and was willing to sacrifice even the throne if he could but win her. Mrs. Fitzherbert was not the sort of woman to give herself up readily to a morganatic connection. Moreover, she soon came to love Prince George too well to entangle him in a doubtful alliance with one of another faith than his. Not long after he first met her, the princess and messengers riding in hot haste to her house to tell her, that he had stabbed himself, that he begged to see her, and that unless she came he would repeat the act. The lady yielded, and hurried to Carlton House, the prince's residence, but she was prudent enough to take with her the Duchess of Devonshire, who was a reigning beauty of the court. The scene which followed was theatrical rather than impressive. The prince was found in his sleeping chamber, pale and with his ruffles blood-stained. He played the part of a youthful and love-stricken wooer, vowing that he would marry the woman of his heart or stab himself again. In the presence of his messengers, who, with the Duchess, were witnesses, he formally took the lady as his wife, while Lady Devonshire's wedding ring sealed the troth. The prince also acknowledged it in a document. Mrs. Fitzherbert was, in fact, a woman of sound sense. 
Shortly after this scene of melodramatic intensity her wits came back to her, and she recognized that she had merely gone through a meaningless farce. So she sent back the prince's document and the ring and hastened to the continent, where he could not reach her, although his detectives followed her steps for a year. At the last she yielded, however, and came home to marry the prince in such fashion as she could. A marriage of love, and surely one of morality, though not of parliamentary law. The ceremony was performed in her own drawing room in her house in London, in the presence of the officiating Protestant clergyman, and two of her own nearest relatives. This is drawn from the journal of Lord Stoughton, who was Mrs. Fitzherbert's cousin and confidant. The truth of it was never denied, and Mrs. Fitzherbert was always treated with respect, and even regarded as a person of great distinction. Nevertheless, on more than one occasion the prince had his friends in Parliament deny the marriage in order that his debts might be paid and new allowances issued to him by the Treasury. George certainly felt himself a husband. Like any other married prince, he set himself to build a palace for his country home. While in search of some suitable spot he chanced to visit the pretty fishing village of Brighton to see his uncle, the Duke of Cumberland. Doubtless he found it an attractive place, yet this may have been not so much because of its view of the sea as for the reason that Mrs. Fitzherbert had previously lived there. However, in 1784 the prince sent down his chief cook to make arrangements for the next royal visit. The cook engaged a house on the spot where the pavilion now stands, and from that time Brighton began to be an extremely fashionable place. The court, doctors, giving advice that was agreeable, recommended their royal patient to take sea bathing at Brighton. At once the place sprang into popularity. During his life with Mrs. Fitzherbert at Brighton the prince held what was practically a court. Hundreds of the aristocracy came down from London and made their temporary dwellings there, while thousands who were by no means of the court made the place what is now popularly called London by the sea. No one felt any doubt as to the marriage of the two persons, who seemed so much like a prince and a princess. The old king and his wife, however, much deplored their son's relation with her. This was partly due to the fact that Mrs. Fitzherbert was a Catholic and that she had received a number of French nuns who had been driven out of France at the time of the Revolution. But no less displeasure was caused by the prince's racing and dicing, which swelled his debts to almost a million pounds, so that Parliament and, indeed, the sober part of England, were set against him. At length the time came when the King, Parliament, and the people at large insisted that the Prince of Wales should make a legal marriage, and a wife was selected for him in the person of Caroline, daughter of the Duke of Brunswick. This marriage took place exactly ten years after his wedding with the beautiful and gentle-mannered Mrs. Fitzherbert. With the latter he had known many days and hours of happiness. With Princess Caroline he had no happiness at all. Her life with the prince soon became one of open warfare, but instead of leaving England she remained to set the kingdom in an uproar. As soon as his father died and he became king, George sued her for divorce. Half the people sided with the queen, while the rest regarded her as a vulgar creature, who made love to her attendants and brought dishonor on the English throne. Well might he look back to the time when he enjoyed the sincere and disinterested love of the gentle woman, who was his wife in all but legal status. Caroline of Brunswick was thrust away from the king's coronation. She took a house within sight of Westminster Abbey, so that she might make hag-like screeches to the mob and to the king as he passed by. Presently, in August, 1821, only a month after the coronation, she died, and her body was taken back to Brunswick for burial. George himself reigned for nine years longer. When he died in 1830 his executor was the Duke of Wellington. The Duke, in examining the late King's private papers, found that he had kept with the greatest care every letter written to him by his beloved wife. Of George it may be said that he has left as memories behind him only three things that will be remembered. The first is the pavilion at Brighton, with its absurdly oriental decorations, its minarets and flimsy towers. The second is the buckle which he invented. The last is the story of his marriage to Maria Fitzherbert, and of the influence exercised upon him, by the affection of a good woman.